So, Arthur Keller, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think we'd like to start where uh, we've started with everybody else, which is on the topic of development, uh, which is appropriate for you since you've been on the Planning Commission for eight years after uh, now you've had a little bit of a, a gap, mm -hmm. gaining some perspective on, uh, on things as you um, as, as you've led up to this election campaign. I'm wondering if you could um, begin by um, telling us how you would approach serving on the city council any differently than the role you, you saw yourself playing on the planning commission with respect to development issues. Will we see any change in your approach uh, to evaluating issues as a city council member rather than as a planning commissioner? Well, firstly, the role of a planning commissioner is different from the role of a city council member. Uh, the planning commission is an advisory body uh, to the city council. Uh, it's a, basically a recommending body, and the city council uh, actually makes the ultimate decisions. Um, so in that case, uh, obviously, I would be reading the minutes of the city of the Planning and Transportation Commission rather than saying them. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that that is one part of the difference. Um, also, uh, I think that the um, Planning Commission, I was trying to basically treat that as a non-political role, but giving it my um, best judgment on what makes sense uh, in terms of each project. Um, in this case, uh, I think that the broader issues are actually come to play. I wouldn't, not, not that I'm saying I'm playing politics, but the issue is the broader issues come to play um, and more policy making uh, is the role of the council. Um, so I think that in terms of um, thinking about future growth, um, that uh, the idea of, of having uh, growth that is responsible, uh, that considers its impacts, uh, those policy issues are more policy issues for the, uh, for the city council uh, than they are for the comp plan. Uh, I mean, what they are for the planning commission. And actually, what's interesting is that having served as co-chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee on the comp plan update uh, for the last uh, year or so, um, and having been involved in the comp plan update before that on the planning commission, I think that that's uh, given me a, a good background in terms of the broader issues that will help me uh, make the decisions on um, the uh, city council. Uh, but effectively, you know, I'm, I'm still the same person. I'm not beholden to any, any interests. I'm basically beholden to the interests, uh, the special interests, I'm beholden to the interests of uh, the people who are the residents um, and uh, small uh, businesses in Palo Alto. Can you think of an example of an issue that you dealt with on the planning commission where had, had you been on the city council, you would have brought in this broader perspective and looked at an issue differently? Um, well, uh, I think that uh, in terms of, I voted, uh, first of all, I initiated um, the uh, planned community zone for Maybell. Um, and I think that because I'm in, I'm, I'm in favor, I thought it was a good project from the point of view of having affordable senior housing. I thought that and from that perspective, it was a good project. And just to clarify, you mean you voted to initiate the PC process? Actually, I made the motion to do the initiation. So I did more right. than vote for it. I, I made the motion. But you didn't initiate the, 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 the whole process of That's right. development. That's right. I, 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 I voted on the Planning Commission to initiate the PC zone. Right. I wasn't there when the, pro, when the project was voted on um, to approve it. Um, I had recommended that the, and I, I think everybody on the, on the Planning Commission at that time, recommended that they have uh, fewer uh, market rate homes, that they basically be more compatible uh, with Maybell and, and think about the impacts of that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I thought that, that in terms of having affordable senior housing, that was a laudable goal. In terms of the um, city council position there, uh, I think that I would have been more cognizant uh, of uh, making sure that the community was involved in a discussion and that there was an appropriate process for, um, for community engagement. Um, and I'm used to, on the Planning Commission, there not being nearly that much community engagement, although we try to foster it. It more often happens at the city council level. And so, uh, you know, try as we, as, as we can to try to get people to come to our meetings in the comp plan. We have gotten some. 
um, and come to the meetings of the Planning Commission. Um, most people show up at the City Council, so making sure that the community engagement part is, is, is there is, is how that would have been different. Um, as a, uh, our, our history with planning commissioners who ascend to serve on the City Council has shown that those individuals um, are quite active on the Council when it comes to the consideration of planning items. Uh, they bring with them such a wealth of, of information and insight that uh, there are some that feel that they uh, dominate the discussion and lengthen it considerably by the, the number of probing, planning-oriented questions that really were more appropriately addressed either at the Planning Commission level or at the staff level. Do you uh, have any concerns about the way you've seen past Planning Commissioners function on the Council, and do you have a plan to adjust your own uh, approach to these issues if you're elected to the Council? Um, well, on the Planning Commission, I was very detail-oriented and very, very focused on, um, on the, um, on vetting that the project met all of the dot of the I's and crossing the T's. And I think at the Council, it's, we're more at the policy level. Um, and I think that that is a, would be a change of direction. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, the Planning Commission will do a good job of vetting the details. Um, uh, you know, that being said, I think that um, it's uh, important to ensure that we get the highest quality projects approved um, and that we ensure that the projects are the highest quality uh, that go through the process. So just to follow up on that, do you feel like you'd be under some degree of constraint or restraint as a council member in dealing with planning items? Um, well, I think that each person has their different kinds of expertise. After all, uh, Greg Scharf has land use lawyer background, um, and um, you know, just I'm not sure he would get on the council. But if Greer Stone were on the council, um, he also has a legal background, and 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 I bring that to bear. Um, and uh, I have a computer science background and a data science background, and and I bring that to bear. Uh, but I think that on the council, there's a need for balance. Um, and I think that no one person should dominate any discussion, and I'm certainly cognizant of that. And when I uh, serve as, when I chair the Citizens Advisory Committee on the Comp Plan update meetings, uh, I make sure that everybody has appropriate time to speak. Um, and in fact, at the last meeting that I chaired, we started five minutes late. Uh, we had a 10 minute break in the middle between items, and we ended five minutes early. Um, so according to the schedule. So I think that that's the kind of thing that I, 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 we, can, we made good decisions. We Everybody had a chance to say their piece. I think we felt good about the result. Uh, and um, that's the kind of thing that I think that we should do on council. I wanted to probe you a little bit about some of the votes that you took while on the Planning Commission. Sure. Um, so you voted for the PC uh, zone for the College Terrace Center, um, the revised PC for the Lytton Gateway, um, the initial Edgewood Plaza PC. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on those and, and, and say whether or not you're satisfied with how these projects have turned out and whether or not you would have done anything differently. Um, well, uh, one thing that I think is important, particularly for the revised PC, for, um, <clears throat> for uh, in, terms of, in terms of the um, Edgewood Plaza and uh, the College Terrace Center, I'm certainly in favor of, of grocery stores, and I think that it's important to retain them. Um, I think we should have had more teeth in, in those, uh, particularly with Edgewood Plaza, uh, in terms of grocery store. Um, and so part of the issue of public benefits and requiring those public benefits and ensuring they, they are provided is important. Um, I was disappointed when, essentially, uh, there was a switch uh, for College Terrace Center, it was clear that uh, the implication was that we would have JJF continue, and once that was approved, they said go bye bye to JJF, which was I think done in a in a uh, disrespectful manner. Um, in terms of uh, 101 Lytton, uh, the Lytton, the uh, uh, one, Lytton and and um, Alma Street, uh, I think that. Um, I think that, that, that uh, there are a couple of things about that project. First of all, uh, one thing I wanted 
uh, was for the project increase in uh, office density to be taken by using transferable development rights. And I re recommended that. And staff said that that couldn't, be, couldn't happen. Um, so I let it go. Uh, but actually, uh, in subsequent review of transferable development rights, there is actually no reason it could, they couldn't have used up transferable development rights um, for that project. Um, I, couldn't, I don't understand why they said it couldn't be done. And that would have used up a lot of transferable development rights from downtown for that project. I think that, that would have made, made sense. Um, I, I think that um, we also need to think about uh, parking issues. For example, the exemption. Uh, now that we have residential parking permit programs, which wasn't in place when the project was approved, I think that projects like that that are supposedly self-parked, that are, provide the parking uh, that, that uh, for the demand that they generate, uh, those projects should not be eligible for RPP permits. Because if they say they have the parking they need, then they don't need permits. Um, so I think that standards like that are required. Um, it, just on that point, is that something that the city can come back and do now? Deny those permits to buildings like what you're referring to? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think there as far be as the reason they couldn't do that, I, so. I agree with that. As far as the residential parking permit program right. is done, I've 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 advocated that we not give uh, RPP permits to uh, recently approved to, to recently approved projects that are supposedly self parked, and, and so I think that that would make sure that these, these projects are actually self parked, and, and uh, so uh, that's a factor there. Um, I think that when that project was approved, the jobs housing imbalance wasn't as acute as it is now. Um, so the need for additional housing um, uh, that is generated by office space uh, wasn't as, as acute uh, as it is now. And just to follow up on um, your point that more teeth maybe should have been required for the grocery store benefits, um, right. what, what would you, if you were on the council now, what would you uh, do about Edgewood Plaza? Uh, well, I'm in favor of increasing the, uh, an the daily penalty for that. Um, I wish that uh, when Fresh Market had closed, that the city had said, oh, you don't have a market there, so what we're going to do is we're going to keep you from selling the remaining, I think there were one or two homes that were still not sold. And uh, that would have uh, uh, really made sure that we had a market back then. Uh, you know, uh, this was, I, I, I believe my, my data is correct that there was one or two homes that still hadn't sold. Um, and, and basically saying you're not providing the, the, the benefit and therefore you, you, we're going to go to court to file an injunction that you can't sell them. And I think that we could have done that and we didn't do that. And I think that that was a missing opportunity. Now, it's too late for this, uh, this council to go back and, uh, and, and, and change, change things in the past. Uh, but I think that enforcing our planned community rules are important. Uh, and I think that uh, and but not only that, um, 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 and basically in being clearer about our enforcing of zoning rules in general um, and enforcing of, of transportation demand management programs and things like that. Uh, we have not been enforcing those. Um, and um, <clears throat> it, it's not clear how well they're written in such a way that they can easily be measured and enforced. Um, so you would support a graduated increase in the penalties against the developer there in, uh, until the grocery store was provided? I think that, that I think there's a proposal of five thousand dollars a day, and I think that well, that's that, yeah, that sort of out of the blue, but yeah, yeah. So you just I, go from one thousand to five thousand, and uh, I think that that's possible. I, I haven't you know I haven't looked at the details of what what's what's appropriate here, um, but I think that um, um, the issue is to. Uh, make clear to the to the to the developer to to Sand Hill Properties that we mean business and they need to do it. You know, after all, they're collecting they're collecting rent from Fresh Market, and so it, and I'm not sure if part of the rent includes a percentage of sales. There, obviously, they would be losing that. I'm not privy to the nature of the contract between uh, Fresh Market and and Sand Hill Properties, um, but essentially, we need to make it um, more economically uh, clear uh, that we mean business. More economically painful. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that your position on the continuation of the PC zone, the planned community zone, is that it should not be brought back. Um, but I don't want to. I want to make sure you have a chance to explain your. Sure. Well, um, what's interesting to me <clears throat> is that um, 
the project that's happening that is being reviewed, let me put it this way, it's being, it was a preliminary review for El Camino and, um, and Page Mill Road um, is essentially a PC and is not, we're not getting the benefits of it being a PC. Um, so it's unfortunate that here's a project that if we were to approve, getting those public benefits makes sense. Uh, because uh, as far as I understand, there is some value that can be obtained from in, in doing the upzoning, and that value is typically captured in a public benefit. Now, I suppose we could have a sort of development agreement that, which is kind of a planned community zone in a different, a different, different uh, clothing, if you will, <coughs> that basically does that value capture. Uh, I'd actually be in favor of the value capture being used to create a master lease uh, for, uh, in favor of the city for a reduced price block of, of, of apartments um, that reduce rent that could be then sublet by the city, rented by the city to, um, to uh, police officers, firefighters, utility workers, um, so that they could, th those who will take care of us uh, in the event of a, a major earthquake could, could live there. Okay, I, I, my question was broader than that. Uh, yeah. the, 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 there's a unique situation at El Camino and Page Mill because it's a public facility zone property, so in essence, the city can negotiate anything it wants to there. <coughs> right. um, it's not your typical PC. Um, and what my question is, is do you think the planned community zone should die permanently? Um, or are you open to bringing it back in some new form? Um, well, I think that uh, we need to think carefully before we uh, do any uh, new PCs other than this potential one for uh, Page Mill Road and El Camino. Um, and that is because the PC has been abused too often in the past. Um, so um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm not saying never, uh, but I do say that uh, we do need to think long and hard before we do that, and maybe, that's be maybe that requires a vote of the people to approve individual PCs. Maybe it requires um, that uh, we go through special vetting process. Um, but right now, other than this project, um, I don't see any particular reason for PCs. There's, other, there's two other things to consider that may make sense, um, and that is um, uh, we may need to do things for 100% affordable housing projects. Uh, that, in, that involve the special zoning rules. And so uh, that's a situation that we might want to consider. And maybe that's done through standard zoning. Maybe that's done through a PC. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that I, that I would consider. But I wouldn't want to have a general, I wouldn't want to basically create wholesale, we're going to create PCs again, because I think that those have not worked very well in the past. Well, and the current state of that is, that it's, we're not accepting any more applications for PC. So it, in essence, no longer exists, correct? Uh, well, it's still on the books. I mean, there's still laws. So it's just administratively that we're saying we're not going to process any more PCs? Or? Uh, I, I, think that, I, think that, I think technically it's a moratorium. Um, so, but but the, the legislation, there are still on the books rules for PCs. Uh, but you, if you have a moratorium, on, then you don't accept any more. Okay. So I understand that your um, viewpoint about the annual office cap is that you would like it to be made permanent or permanent until it's changed? Right. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, do you see an expansion of the geographical area that that um, applies to, or do you see a change in the 50,000 square feet foot number? Um, well, I'd like to divide that into several different questions. Um, the first is, in terms of geographical area, I think it should be considered two parts. One part is the Stanford Research Park, and one part is everywhere else. And so I wouldn't limit it to just certain, certain zones in, in, uh, other than the Stanford Research Park. It's just everywhere but the, in, but the Stanford Research Park. Secondly, I propose that the Stanford Research Park um, be treated separately. Um, that is essentially an office park and, and, uh, uh, the, and, and is a place where we have traditionally had uh, more, um, more office uses. And so there I've suggested that um, we make any, uh, could be a development agreement with the Stanford Research Park uh, that says that 
in exchange for uh, increased development, uh, as some sort of exemption from the annual limit, uh, that uh, we have uh, at least a reduction in traffic. Uh, I've suggested that maybe the way to do that is a level of service which is congestion on certain key intersections around the Stanford Research Park as a, as a way of, of measuring that. Um, maybe something in terms of providing housing there um, for uh, the workers who, who peop so that we could deal with the jobs housing imbalance and reduce, reduce traffic by having people who work at the Stanford Research Park actually live there. Not clear you can actually enforce that, but it will help in that regard. Um, so that's, a, that's where uh, I think in terms of dealing with that. In terms of the exact number of 50,000, uh, I think that's a good placeholder for now. Uh, it seems to be a reasonable amount. Um, I'd want to revisit that every so often based on how we measure uh, the citywide impact. So for example, if traffic gets worse, then we might want to ratchet that down. If traffic seems to be getting better, then we might want to uh, lift that a little bit. And so I, I'm as a and trained as an engineer, uh, I think in terms of feedback loops. So you essentially align the incentives of the business community with the, um, with the people who live here, um, saying that if you deal with the impacts of growth, you can grow some more. And if, you growth gets, if the impacts get worse, you grow some less. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's the, the practice that I would do. So when you uh, divided those two geographical areas, between Stanford Research Park and everyone else, was the 50,000 still on everyone, or was the 50,000 just on uh, everyone else, and then Stanford would have its own square footage? Uh, it would be on everyone but the Stanford Research Park, because the Stanford Research Park would have its own policies. Um, there was a Mayfield Agreement that happened some years ago. Um, and the Mayfield Agreement involved, originally it was space for the Jewish Community Center, um, and then was changed to the Stanford Mayfield playing fields. It involved the housing that's the upper Mayfield housing and the low, uh, uh, for faculty and staff and the low income housing on El Camino. Um, so I think that there's possibility to, to do that to do that kind of agreement again um, based on how much growth would happen. Um, and in this case, it would not only be in terms of housing uh, but also, and, and land in this case, but also would have to do with, with uh, um, traffic. I think that that traffic is a, is, is a big concern. Um, so I think that that we need to take that into account uh, for renegotiating another agreement. I'm a little concerned about um, having the housing within Palo Alto be for um, Stanford University employees. Um, I think that's part of the general use permit uh, that's going to be renegotiated for Stanford, for ex extended for uh, actually a new permit to allow Stanford to grow even more. Uh, they need to deal with their jobs housing imbalance, uh, which is actually worse on a ratio of jobs to employed residents, it's actually worse at Stanford than it is for Palo Alto. So they need to deal with theirs as well on campus. Um, the Mayfield Agreement that you reference provided Stanford the opportunity to expand beyond current zoning the amount of commercial space in the research part. Mm -hmm. At least that's my recollection. I believe that's correct. They have not uh, built out to that additional space, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, are you suggesting that this transportation um, management and no net new trip approach to future development in the research park be applied to space that they're entitled now to be able to build or to space that in the future beyond that? Um, that's a good question. So let me, let me tell you, that there's, it's kind of tricky about that because um, with respect to Stanford University, there's a clear defined perimeter. And so you can put down rope counts and you can figure out when cars are going across and, and how many cars are, are actually arriving. And, and uh, there were issues in terms of cars parking in, the, uh, in College Terrace for people who are going and maybe now they're parking in Evergreen Park or <laughs> now they're no longer parking in downtown, but you know the, the, there's a little bit of the toothpaste being squeezed in the, in the tube somewhere else. Uh, that's a little hard to do with the Stanford um, Research Park because there's not a defined perimeter. Uh, however, since Stanford University now has a zero net new trips, it's not contributing to the problem more. Um, and so Stanford Research Park is contributing 
significantly to the problem and therefore um, having Stanford Research Park deal with that um, in, as, an, as an exemption to the annual growth limit. Uh, so I would do, do that kind of, uh, kind of negotiation uh, there uh, with them on that. Um, and it may be a modification to the development agreement for, um, for uh, the Stanford Research Park. Uh, I think that that needs to be studied and, and, and um, explored more. The, one of the factors that I would do is that um, in terms of transportation measures, um, I don't want to be prescriptive. I want them to figure out how to do that, just as they have done as an excellent job with Stanford University. They had the brightest minds figure out how to do it, and they've done rather well. And so I'd rather they figure it out and not have any particular set of rules. However, um, the rules for the Stanford University, for Stanford universities, um, uh, was, was outcome-based. It was no net new trips. Do it however you wish. The rules for the Stanford University Medical Center expansion, or right-sizing as they prefer to call it, um, it was actually efforts-based. You know, you'll give out away so many Caltrain passes and, and whatever, and we don't know exactly how many, how many um, trips we'll reduce. Um, and I prefer outcome-based measures to, to, to efforts-based measures. I tried to get outcome-based measures, but I didn't succeed. I think one of the concerns that's been expressed is that um, looking at projects and sort of uh, tying in conditions on a project-by-project -project basis mm -hmm. is somehow not capturing cumulative impacts um, yes. in the city. Um, what thoughts do you have as terms of, in terms of how we can get a handle on uh, sort of like a baseline for all the different kinds of in, uh, cumulative impacts that are happening, um, aside from just looking at each project as it comes up and trying to do our best estimates as to how much traffic and how many people are going to be um, uh, brought in? Well, I think that there's more that we can do about individual projects first. Okay. Um, and it's, I'm going to get pretty technical. So, <laughs> uh, so it turns out that um, when you measure um, the impacts, traffic impacts, you have uh, two questions. One question is, what is the baseline that you're comparing it with? And the second question is, when you consider the new amount of traffic, what, how much difference between the baseline and the new amount of traffic is considered significant? Um, it turns out that our baseline is typically on the highest use possible for the building. And if it's been unoccupied for years, it's the highest use is going to be higher than anybody has ever, maybe, maybe higher than everybody has ever experienced with that building. And yet they get credit for that because they have an existing building. Uh, that's not quite fair. And, and even, if, it's, even if, it's, if it is fully occupied, um, we don't do it based on the actual traffic generator. We do it based on this theoretical analysis. That doesn't make sense. We should do it based on actually measuring traffic that is generated from this project in the last, say, two years. And then we'll, do, then we'll have a real value to compare against. And it also is incentive not to keep buildings empty, as was done, for example, Alma Plaza. They were keeping it empty for year, a lot of buildings empty for years in order to do their redevelopment. I think that we want to disincentive, disincentivize that. The second thing um, is what as I talked about is the threshold, how much difference between the calculated amount um, and the baseline is considered a threshold. And it turns out that Menlo Park's thresholds are more strict than ours. Um, and that's why when, the, we'd st when we did the Stanford University Medical Center, the Stanford Med Medical Center expansion, um, there were more intersections that had impacts in Menlo Park than there were once in Palo Alto because the, they were, even though those were further away because of the thresholds. I want to switch gears here to housing, um, which is a hot topic, of course, and ask you uh, what type of new housing development do you consider a priority, if any, in Palo Alto? And how would you go about achieving that in a way that um, really achieved that, that goal of creating more housing? Well, what we need is a balance of the kind of housing, uh, not just one kind. Um, what's interesting is in the first decade of this millennium, we essentially created one kind of housing. We mostly created three, four, five bedroom townhouses. It caused a wave of students flowing through our schools. Um, 
it, we created very little housing for seniors. We created very little housing for younger people. That's, that's just not what we created because essentially we created what was most economic to, for developers. We need, with Palo Alto graying, we need more housing for seniors who can want to downsize. I'm happy with seniors staying in their homes as long as they can manage it. Um, my mom is getting up there in years, um, and she plans to stay in her place for as long as she possibly can. And she's in a, a, a you know, in a, in a, a condo and, and one, one level and uh, at ground level, and she's staying there. And that's great. Uh, but for people who may have bigger homes and multiple stories and want to downsize or want to move closer to the services, we don't have a place for them to go. So that's important. Um, also, it turns out that 60% of households in Palo Alto are one or two persons. 20% of housing units in Palo Alto are studios or one bedrooms. Um, so clearly, we have a need for smaller units. Um, but we also need family-oriented housing, especially uh, aff aff affordable family-oriented housing for uh, the people who are taking care of us, for police, fire, uh, fighters, for our um, utility workers, and also work with the school district to provide housing for young teachers on school district land. Um, so there's, um, there's a lot of, of, of moving pieces. Um, and it's not just that any one is a priority, it's really a balance that we need to create um, and understanding um, how, how it all fits together to create, to maintain an inclusive community. Finally, it's not only about what housing we build, it's also about what housing we retain. So for example, retaining Buena Vista, I think is key, um, because that's a, a large amount of, uh, you know, 100 units of, of, of affordable housing that we should retain, the people in that community. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, cottages and uh, small units, uh, you know, of sort of accessory dwelling units with existing properties, and we should retain those because those are uh, are tend to be more affordable than um, building new um, uh, uh, accessory dwelling units. So uh, it's both more environmental, uh, plus these tend to be more affordable than than the new ones that people build. So to take the Olive Garden project as an example yes. of trying to uh, make some degree of progress on the housing challenges that you've just described, Yes. Um, that project will, if built, uh, create 17 units of market rate housing and two units of below market housing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's on a fairly large parcel along El Camino. Mm -hmm. um, is that the kind of incremental development that you're looking for? Uh, well, let me give you a couple of issues about that project. So firstly, I want to increase the amount of, uh, amount of requirement for affordable housing from 15% to 25% as San Francisco and other places have done. So we might get two and a half units of below market rate housing. Uh, well, let's see. Since if it, they if, didn't have to give two, that was, that was extracted at the council meeting. Well, if it were, let's suppose it's 20 units, that would be five. So maybe two instead of five. If, instead of 19 units, it would be four in a fraction, which we round up to five. So you get three additional ones. Uh, in addition, I'm in favor of um, increasing um, the impact fees um, so that uh, on, on development so that we can build more affordable housing. It turns out that in, you know, in past housing element, we have built more housing than, we were, than was required but we've built mostly market rate housing. We've built less affordable housing than was required. And so it, we, have a, we have a need for, for increasing the diversity. And so that, I think that that's important to focus on that. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, currently uh, is essentially studying that to death. It's a, a, a paralysis by analysis is what they're doing. Um, and um, I think that's, that's their way of, of avoiding dealing with the project because it can't go to the city. They figured out that it can't go to the city council until they actually vote on it one way or the other, and so they're avoiding voting on it. But, but underlying all this is the cost of land. Yes. And the only way to reduce the, or to increase the affordability of any kind of housing, whether it's for sale or rental housing, is either through market rate housing subsidizing it, Yes. Um, or finding free land presumably owned by the city already, such as on city parking lots, something like that. Um, 
with one option in either case being to build beyond the 50 foot height limit so that you are able to do a denser development and spread the cost over more units. So which of those kind of strategies are you, are you prepared to support to increase the affordability, that, that small batch of housing that comes with some of these projects uh, that are affordable? What lengths are you willing to go to to provide that kind of housing? So let's talk first about for sale housing, certainly increasing the percentage uh, the required percentage of, of uh, below market rate housing as an right. inclusionary zoning is one thing that we can do and that will help and, and that essentially creates moderate income uh, below market rate housing which we can't create it in other ways because the funding doesn't come for that. And drives up the cost of the other housing? Um, not, I don't think so and the reason I don't think so is because uh, typically uh, what happens is that uh, it affects the land value. So when you think about how much you'll sell the property for, and you think about uh, what the developer's profits are, uh, essentially um, by saying the developer doesn't make as much profit because uh, would, wouldn't otherwise make as much profit uh, because uh, they couldn't economically build that, that, that adjusts the level of the price of land. So essentially, it, it, it's, it's really a, a trigger on that. It doesn't, it, do, it doesn't change the price of the housing units. The housing unit price is, basic, is based on supply and demand uh, and what the market will bear. And uh, basically, the market goes up, is going up and is, is a, it, it seems to be um, nearly insatiable. Uh, so I do not believe, and I'm not an economist, uh, but I'm a computer scientist, and I you know, understand the logic of it, and so it essentially affects the price of land, and, and I think that's important. Because if you can affect the price of land, you can also make affordable housing projects be more economic. Um, and therefore, those can be built uh, better. Uh, my brother, I don't know if you know this, my brother Marty Keller uh, lives in Palo Alto, and he works for First Community Housing. And they build a green affordable housing uh, in Santa Clara Valley, and they've actually made um, they've actually had some award-winning green projects. Um, but I think that, that we need to think about how we build these projects in such a way uh, that they can be done. Uh, there's there's uh, the project we did at, uh, at 801 Alma, and, and although I think it's important that we did a project like that, I wish it looked better, um, but I think it was, it was a great project to do um, in, in terms of providing family-oriented housing at, at, at low income. Uh, that cobbled together a number of different sources. There was, there was land from utilities, there was land from OLAs, from getting money from classic communities development. So I think we can think about that. There are some more uh, pieces of land around town uh, that we can deal with. It depends, on, there, it depends on adjacency. So I wouldn't put a tall building next to, um, you know, on El Camino next to single family residences, which there are some in Barron Park, for example, right behind there. Uh, there are places, right places for doing that, and the current housing element actually has in there uh, a program to do a study of where it is appropriate to think about increasing the height limit above 50 feet, and I think we should engage in that study. I, would, I, wouldn't, I don't want to prejudge the answer to that, um, but that's for affordable housing, and I think that we need to understand uh, what that, what that uh, framework uh, is for that. And also raising more money through um, housing impact fees. Uh, would also help make it more affordable. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 you and I are both in support of uh, Measure A on the ballot to raise $950 million um, for affordable housing in Santa Clara County. I want to ask you really quickly, because I know we're running out of time, um, about code enforcement. Yes. It seems like one of the things that uh, drives people nuts is just the lack of ability to trust that what they think is going to happen is actually happening. Whether you have construction violations, retail violations, short-term rentals, Airbnb type um, uh, violations. So I noticed that was one of your platforms for reasons for running for council. What do you think um, is the reason why codes aren't being enforced and what would you propose that the city do if you were elected? Uh, well, I think that uh, I'm not sure why codes aren't being enforced. It might not be a priority, even though we hired a new code enforcement officer. They seem to be giving more warnings than, uh, than fines. Um, and um, when you give a warning, um, you know, people 
don't take it as seriously as when you actually impose a fine. So if they start imposing more fines, then the code enforcement officers would, would be easier to do their job. In some sense, what we need um, is a code enforcement surge. So maybe we can transfer some people uh, doing a surge for code enforcement. And when people realize we're serious, then we don't need nearly as, as, nearly as many officers uh, doing that. So I think that that, I think that, that would help. Do you envision uh, some new regulatory approach to the Airbnb situation permitting something uh, that would put in place regulations that limit that? Yes, yeah, several years ago, uh, the, the council looked at Airbnb and decided right. it wasn't a problem. Right. I actually, at my kickoff, uh, which you, I know you couldn't go to, but you can read my, on my website, www.arthurkeller.com. You can click on, click on kickoff, uh, and it will actually have uh, pretty much verbatim of my kickoff speech, at least the, what, I, what I wrote originally. In case someone is, doesn't have the inclination to do that, can you just quickly summarize what you... Sure. I believe that we should have Airbnb ordinance. San Francisco has one. Other cities have one. We should explore what they've done. Um, and um, go ahead and create one, uh, and I, that's one of the things we should do quickly. It's getting out of hand. Uh, I don't want accessory dwelling units being used for Airbnb. Um, I don't want these houses being used where you rent out individual units, uh, individual beds as Airbnb in a, a house with uh, many, many beds in them. You know, that's, that's not, that, that, that's not and fostering the character of the neighborhood. Do you fear that this has already gotten to a point where reaching an agreement within the community on this is going to be challenging? Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, you know, uh, we've had other divisive issues in the past. Uh, I, you know, for example, with, with historic preservation, I don't think that Airbnb is going to be nearly as divisive as, as, uh, as, as that was. Uh, I think that uh, this is one that we can come to a consensus on. Um, and looking at what other cities have done and how successful they were at it. Uh, people remember that San Francisco defeated an Airbnb ordinance in the ballot place. However, they had already had one in place. It was just making it stricter. Um, so I think we need to compare and see what they've done. So last question. Um, if you're elected, you'll be part of a city council that replaces the current city manager, Jim Keene. Um, and I'm wondering, as you're thinking about uh, that process, how the person you end up hiring, or at least you end up preferring, will be different, if at all, from Jim Keene? I think this is an excellent opportunity to think about the governance of our city. And the city council only selects the four council appointed officers. It's the city manager that selects all of the other um, people who work for the city. And um, so in terms of utilities and workers, until, you know, until we manage staff, in terms of planning and management staff, you know, all uh, police and fire, all those are managed by the city manager. So I would want to fairly early in um, this uh, process uh, uh, next year to start a community dialogue. Just as we started a community dialogue on the comp plan, um, we should start a community dialogue on how we want governance of our city to be. And so it should not merely be a process of hiring a new city manager. It should really be a think, rethinking of how the city manager relates to the council and how the city manager relates to uh, the staff um, and uh, allow that dialogue um, with, the, with the community to um, allow us to realign uh, how the, the, the staff uh, relates to the council, uh, because this, this is such an important decision. Sounds so, like you've got an opinion on this that perhaps you'd like to share. You, um, you've described a process. I described the process. So I, I'm not prejudging the output of the process. Um, I think that what we want to do is in, in, engage people in figuring out and look at other cities and how their governance process works for, for this in order to um, figure out how um, best the city um, staff and manager um, can work with the council um, in moving together.
um, to, uh, and uh, for the best governments, governance, government and governance of the city of Palo Alto that we can have. But implicit in that comment is that there's something about it now that you're not fully embracing or comfortable with. Well, I think that part of it is that we have had um, councils in the past that have been for unbridled growth, unlimited growth. Um, and this council has come on um, with some important policies, uh, protecting ground floor retail, um, ha having the annual office growth cap, um, dealing, implementing the residential parking permit program, and things like that. Um, and those have been very important measures. Um, and in some sense, uh, dealing with the city government is sort of like, um, it's following a direction, sort of like turning a battleship. And um, I've never been to the Navy, but I've read about it. And, and the thing about turning a battleship is, is that you can't just turn the rudder. There's actually a little thing on the rudder called a trim tab. And you turn the trim tab, and that allows you to start turning the rudder. So we have, trim, we have turned the trim tab, we have started to turn the rudder, um, and so, um, the, the, in terms of a direction of being of the city being more responsive to to the needs of the the, pe the people who live here and small businesses uh, who uh, who, uh, who are in Palo Alto and people who work in Palo Alto, I think we we have just started to do that, um, and we need to continue that process. And by having a city dialogue in that process, um, I think that uh, that will allow us to better align. Um, the city government uh, with the people. Arthur Keller, thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you.